everybody. Uh, my name is Beth Schumann. I'm the executive director of American Friends of Combatants for Peace. We are very excited um, to bring you this talk today. Um, we have a great panel, as you can see on the screen. Um, so this is the third, actually, in a four-part series on American complicity in the Israeli occupation. Uh, the first talk was a few months ago, um, really focusing more on the historical background. The second talk was just a week and a half ago on Amer the institutions of the American government and the American people. This talk is on the evangelical community. And the fourth talk coming up in a week and a half is on uh, the upcoming midterm elections, all of course focused on the ways in which um, Americans, the American public, the American people are complicit in the Israeli occupation. So it's an amazing series. I'll put into the chat box where you can find all of the rest of the talks and sign up for the next talk. Um, and a big thanks as well to our partners at Churches for Middle East Peace, um, who've been with us every step of the way for this talk and in previous series. We're always really grateful and excited to partner with you. Um, and I know this is unconventional at the beginning of a webinar. Usually you find the pitch at the end, but if you enjoy this talk um, and you wanna support the work that we're doing, um, both Combatants for Peace and Churches for Middle East Peace really do need your help. In a year where there's a ground war in Europe and Ukraine and climate change and the midterms, Israel and Palestine um, often gets forgotten. So if you can find it in your heart to support this work, I know both of our organizations would really, really appreciate it. Um, it's what enables us to bring you content like this today, as well as do all of our work on the ground in the region fighting for human rights. Um, so with that said, um, I would like to the specifics of the talk. If you have questions, you'll see in the chat box, you can send questions to send questions here. Uh, that's Lindsay from Combatants for Peace. She will send your questions to Jennifer, who can then moderate them during the talk. Um, and I'll turn it over. Thank you so much, Jennifer. She'll be moderating. She is our the outreach manager at Churches for Middle East Peace, and she'll introduce our speakers. Thanks so much. Enjoy the talk. Thank you, Beth. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being with us today. We are really excited about this important conversation, uh, and it is, as ever, a good time for it. Uh, so thank you for being with us and for being committed uh, to being in conversation about some tough issues. Um, I am going to introduce our amazing panelists for today, and then we'll get going into the conversation. As Beth mentioned, uh, we do have the opportunity for closed captioning today. Uh, so if you would like uh, captions to appear on your screen, you can select enable closed captions or click the three dots that say more, and you should have the option to enable those. All right, so I'd first like to introduce Dr. Bruce Fisk. Bruce is the Senior Research Fellow at the Network of Evangelicals for the Middle East and a former professor of New Testament at Westmont College in California. As a Senior Research Fellow at NIMI, he is responsible for creating Israel-Palestine dialogue curriculum for evangelical and academic groups, curating and writing articles related to evangelical engagement and building relationships with evangelical academic institutions. He has led student and adult programs in Israel-Palestine since 2004. Uh, so he comes to us with both a lot of academic knowledge and a lot of time on the ground in Israel-Palestine. Bruce, thanks for being with us today. Uh, I would next like to introduce Lisa Sharon Harper, who is a prolific speaker, writer, and activist. Harper is the founder and president of Freedom Road uh, US, a consulting group dedicated to shrinking the narrative gap in our nation by designing forums and experiences that bring common understanding, common commitment, and common action. Lisa is an Auburn Theological Seminary senior fellow and the author of several books. Uh, she also writes extensively on shalom and governance, immigration reform, healthcare reform, poverty, racial and gender justice, climate change, and transformational civic engagement. You can find her writing on a number of public platforms, including National Civic Review, Sojourners, The Huffington Post, Relevant Magazine, and Essence Magazine. It is such a pleasure to have you with us. Lisa, thanks for being here today. 
Lastly, I'd like to introduce Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis, who is the senior minister at Middle Church and the author of Fierce Love. Jackie uses her gifts as an author, activist, preacher, public theologian toward creating an anti-racist, just fully welcoming society in which everyone has enough. Middle is the church of her dreams and prayers, a multi-ethnic rainbow coalition of love, justice, and worship that rocks her soul. Dr. Lewis's work has also been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Washington Times, the front page of the New York Times website, New York Times Video, the New York Post, CNN iReport, Essence, Ebony.com, the New York Daily News, the New York Post, the Associated Press, and many more. Thank you so much, uh, Jackie, for being with us today. So um, as you all have heard, uh, we have some esteemed panelists here uh, that are going to help us uh, delve into a, a really nuanced uh, conversation today. So we'll go ahead and get going. And I just wanna say again, as Beth mentioned, if questions come up uh, throughout the course of the talk, uh, you can go ahead and message those two send questions here to Lindsay. And what we have a time reserved uh, at the end of the hour for Q and A. So we'll be um, gathering together all of your questions for that time. So, to start off our, our discussion today, uh, Bruce, I'd like to start with, with asking you a, a question or two. And I'm wondering if you can help us define who it is that we're talking about uh, when we say evangelicals. Uh, what is the community we're speaking of when we talk about evangelical complicity in the Israeli occupation? Uh, why is it that evangelicals tend to be so pro-Israel? And in what ways do we see their support for Israel materialize and perpetuate the conflict in Israel and Palestine? Well, thank you, Jennifer, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Um, I'm uh, delighted to be on this panel and grateful for the opportunity. A quick anecdote, back in uh, 2006, in July, I was in uh, Anata, just north of Jerusalem in the West Bank, and uh, encountered combatants for peace. They were only three months old at that time. And just watching Israeli and Palestinian uh, engage each other uh, with words, not with guns, it, it left a powerful impression. And I'm just so impressed by the work that combatants for peace is doing. And also a big fan of churches for Middle East peace. So it's great to be a part of this conversation. Who, who are the evangelicals? First question. There's about 70 million of them uh, self-identifying as evangelicals in the U.S., but the term is pretty fluid. Um, in 1989, there was a definition uh, that got a lot of traction or description, I should say, uh, with four components that, um, four, four convictions, you could say, that uh, have kind of stood the test of time. Uh, the Bible is God's word. Uh, Jesus' death was uh, sacrificial, salvific, um, you, you have to repent and convert, uh, be born again. And, and then there has to be, fourthly, some kind of evidence in your life of, of that change. Uh, so that's kind of a theological description of the movement. But, you know, in the media and popular media in the U.S. today, um, you know, it's much more often described and seen as a movement, right, or as a political constituency. Uh, in 2016, we've probably all heard that 81% of white voting evangelical Americans voted for Donald Trump. Uh, that slipped a little bit in, 2000, in 2020 uh, to 76%. Um, but according to uh, Ryan Burge, a, a political scientist, 60% of white evangelicals uh, believe that the election was, was stolen. Um, so right-wing conservative, white, reliably Republican is often the way the term is used today. Uh, of course, that Trump Evangelical Alliance elicits cries of anguish from evangelical progressives and maybe non-white evangelicals. Um, Mark Ghali, the uh, editor of Christianity Today, got himself in trouble when he objected to that alliance. Um, Ron Siders, Evangelicals for Social Action, recently changed its name to Christians for Social Action. Uh, the books are coming out, um, some great books out there, many by evangelicals that are not flattering of the evangelical community. I'm thinking of Kristen Coves-Demez, um, Jesus and John Wayne, 
for whom evangelicalism is marked by militant masculinity. Um, a psychologist, David Verhagen, a uh, new book, How White Evangelicals Think. Uh, he's a psychologist, so he gives a diagnosis, and it's called Collective Narcissism. Um, way back in 2007, Chris Hedges was calling the Christian right American fascism. So uh, lots of labels, uh, many of them not, not pretty. Um, just a few demographic comments before we move on to the, the other parts of your question. Um, the white evangelical demographic is aging. Uh, it's the oldest religious group in, in uh, America, I believe. It's median age of 56, and it's shrinking. Uh, they were 23% of the population in 2006. Uh, today, they're 14%. Uh, and one last point, uh, younger evangelicals are becoming less supportive of Israel and more sympathetic to uh, Palestinians, younger meaning like under 35. Uh, so that's a bit of the who. In terms of the, the why, why are American evangelicals so uh, pro-Israel? Uh, yeah, they certainly embraced the Zionist cause. Uh, they celebrated 1948 and 67. Evangelicals cheered um, in 2017 when Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Um, the why question is complicated. I mean, some evangelicals simply feel a palpable kinship with the Jewish people. That would be true of many Christians. Uh, they're grateful for monotheism. They're grateful for their Jewish Messiah, and they offer support in return. Many uh, are justly contrite over the role Christians have played over the centuries in fomenting anti-Semitism and paving the way for the Holocaust. Uh, support for the Jewish state also tracks, especially since 9-11, with Christian antipathy toward Islam and with uh, toward the larger Arab world with which Islam is often conflated. Um, you know, back in, in the day, back in Billy Graham's time, the Christian enemy was uh, communism, right? Uh, well, that's that's changed. So today the, the enemy is radical Islam. A year after uh, the 9-11 attacks, 70% of evangelical leaders saw Islam as a religion of violence. I'm talking Franklin Graham, Pat Robertson, James Dobson, Ted Haggard, all of the, the usual, uh, you know, usual suspects. Uh, for Christian Zionists, however, uh, the principal reason why they defend and support Israel and why they celebrate all of Jerusalem as Israel's capital is theological. God, they would say, has entrusted all of the land to the children of Israel. Uh, the prophet's promises of restoration, national and territorial restoration are unfolding before our eyes. So I define Christian nationalism as theologically, or maybe you could say biblically, motivated support for the state of Israel and its claims to the land. Um, it emerged as we know it uh, really in the 1980s when people like Jerry Falwell uh, climbed down out of the theological bleachers onto the, the political playing field. Uh, but these days, evangelical uh, Christian Zionism has uh, several faces. I want to highlight three. Uh, the, the most recognizable face of, of, of Christian Zionism is what I call apocalyptic. Uh, this is the ideology that says Jewish restoration to the land in our day signals the end times. We are in the end times. The Bible describes contemporary events. Uh, the biblical prophets and the author of Revelation literally saw the future and recorded it, and uh, we're living it. Uh, 1967 comes along, the movement goes on steroids. Uh, now it's possible to have a third temple. Um, an apocalyptic ideology is very binary. It's very, uh, it's very militant. It's very pessimistic. Uh, the Arab-Jewish conflict is going to persist. It can't be fixed. It's going to escalate. I mean, John Hagee has written books like From Daniel to Doomsday, uh, The End of the Age, The Countdown Has Begun. Um, and in these final apocalyptic moments, Palestinians should just get out of the way. Uh, so that's the apocalyptic. A second face of Christian Zionism today is what I call transactional. Uh, we bless Israel in order to be blessed by God. Our support for Israel guarantees divine favor. It's a version of the prosperity gospel. Uh, you could think of Paula White, who was Trump's spiritual advisor. You could think again of John Hagee. Hagee is known for his apocalypticism, but much of his success 
as Dan Hummel points out, has to do with this prosperity theology. And one of the key verses for them is Genesis 12, 3. God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. The one who curses you, I will curse. Uh, that's been called Christian Zionism in a nutshell. The problem is that this blessing of Abraham and Israel translates into blanket endorsement. It translates into a denial of Israel's misdeeds. It translates into silencing Israel's critics. Um, it's spreading. I'm, I'm living now in Peru. It's spreading rapidly in the global south and also among Latinos in particular in the U.S. Uh, and it's not limited to Pentecostals. Um, and so for Jerry Falwell, for Tim LaHaye, and for many others today, to stand with Israel is uh, to stand against Israel is to stand against God. Uh, a third variety of Christian Zionism kind of flies under the radar. I, I, I call it covenantal Christian Zionism. This is not about the last days. This is not about prosperity theology. It actually builds on post-Holocaust Christian re-examinations of Judaism mm -hmm. and the scholarly impulse to interpret early Christianity in its Jewish context. It targets anti-Semitism and supersessionism, uh, sometimes equating the two. Remember, supersessionism is the idea that God has canceled his covenant with the Jews and now cares only about the mostly Gentile church. So it's it's post-supersessionist. Uh, Jesus didn't eliminate the Jew-Gentile distinction. Uh, God preserves the particularity of the nations. So Jesus, Jewish followers of Jesus should continue observing Torah. Now, lots of Christians, non-Christian, non-Zionist Christians affirm God's covenant with Israel. But for these Christian Zionists, that eternal covenant must include the land. We keep coming back to real estate. This is one of the, this is that at the center of this whole discussion. Who gets to, who gets the land? Now, in theory, this is my beef, my complaint. In theory, these folk could uh, combine their covenantal philo-Semitism and restorationism with a prophetic critique of exclusionary Zionism and a critique of the state of Israel for expelling and mistreating Palestinians uh, for its de facto annexation of the West Bank, but they don't. They might say, on a good day, they might say Israel isn't perfect, but don't ask them to list specific questions. Uh, Jeremy Tisby, uh, The Color of Compromise, he reminds us that complicity can be passive, not just active. When you defend Zionism's myth of origins in the face of, of the evidence, and you only talk about Israel's insecurity and only talk about Palestinian perpetual duplicity, when you're silent in the face of injustice, you're complicit. Um, I think we're going to talk about Christian nationalism along the way, so I'll, I'll um, put that on the back burner. Um, how am I doing, Jennifer? I've got one other part of your question to, to address. So that's great. I was actually just going to uh, to tap in here to unfortunately interrupt. Um, would it be okay to save that portion for the next section of the conversation? Yeah, the, the, the final part, maybe the most important is uh, of your question was in what ways are American evangelicals complicit? And, and yeah, I have uh, a short list of areas I'd like to address. Hopefully we'll be able to smuggle that in, but I'll be quiet for now. Great, that sounds good. I think we should have some some time to get that into the conversation soon. Uh, thank you for walking us through uh, kind of so many helpful histories quite quickly and, and bringing us up to speed in the present. Um, I handed you a couple of densely packed questions to start us off, so I'm, I'm grateful. I uh, just wanna underscore a couple of those uh, kind of categories that you outlined for us, um, the, the prophetic um, or the apocalyptic, the transactional uh, and the covenantal as kind of frameworks for thinking about the theological um, relationship of many evangelicals uh, to, to Israel and to this question of land, who gets the land. Um, and yeah, so just very, very grateful for all that you walked us through there. Um, Lisa, I'd love to, to pass the next question to you and, and wondering if you can help us understand the relationship a little bit of Christian nationalism and some of these, uh, some of these Christian Zionist theologies that Bruce just unpacked for us. Um, how does Christian nationalism play a role in American evangelical complicity in the Israeli occupation? And, and Lisa, I know you've written a little bit about and, and spoken out a little bit about the, the relationship between narratives of the, the early 
Puritan colonizers of the U.S. and the narratives of the colonization in Palestine. Uh, so if you want to speak to that element as well, uh, I'm sure it'd be helpful. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for, for this great uh, invitation, first of all, an opportunity to talk with your community. Um, Jennifer and I am going to start with my own conversion story. Um, I went down, walked down the aisle at a Sunday evening camp church meeting down in South Jersey, Cape May, New Jersey, 1983, circa 9.30 at night. Um, it was a Sunday evening camp church meeting with a hellfire brimstone um, itinerant preacher who, I mean, preached his head off about how you're, you're going to go to hell if you didn't come to Jesus right now. And so I had already sat through a lot of different um, uh, altar calls and my friend tapped me on the shoulder and said, would you go up with me? And I was confused because I thought she was already saved. Um, but then we went down to the altar and I was, we were both surrounded by a bunch of, you know, white haired old white ladies because um, it was an all white group you know, in the woods, in the South, <laughs> and me. <laughs> and I think about that context now, and I'm going, what was I doing? You know, but, <laughs> but they surrounded me, not only with prayers, but also with love. And I wept my way into the kingdom that night. I, th I, I say, I joke by proxy. But what I didn't realize is that what I also entered into was I entered into a fundamentalist stream of the church that had been developing in the United States, at, at least um, in large part in the 20th century, um, since the fundamentalist revolts of the 1920s. But also you can trace it back to little sects of fundamentalists that were located here and there um, with, with, with very marginal power in the 1800s. And so when you look at the rise of fundamentalism um, in the 20th century, You've got to look at the Schofield Bible. You've got to look at the monkey trials. You've got to understand that it's the very same people who are um, who are walking out of Princeton um, Seminary and forming Westminster Theological Seminary as a fundamentalist seminary, and and that and that movement is the same people who are um, uh, triggering um, race riots across the, the the Midwest and the South around the exact same time. So you have whiteness um, and you have Christianness at the center of this faith sect. Um, and it's not spoken in that way, but it's absolutely lived out. And, and that sect ends up being at the heart. That's kind of the heartbeat along with don't, we're not going to let the Presbyterians and others off the hook, but mm -hmm. along with um, uh, uh, Southern evangelicals, like the Presbyterians and the Southern Baptists who were already very much a part of um, the, the racial hierarchical structure in the South, who were also at the helm of the Southern segregationist movement. So, so this, is, this is kind of the folk who then turn up in the 1980s and, and 70s actually, and launch this movement that I then stepped into in 1983 without realizing it. That's what I stepped into. Um, Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell, and, and especially Jerry Falwell, actually, they were very much at the helm of a way of understanding um, Christian faith that married um, what we now call dominionism or God exercising God's empire, basically establishing God's empire on earth. And those who were going to lead the empire with God are going to be those basically who are fundamentalists. And the way that they saw the scripture, I remember my first introduction to, first of all, Thief in the Night, um, that movie that scared the bejesus out of me, looking at the razor, you know, buzzing in the sink because everybody has been flashed up to heaven in the rapture. And for decades, I wondered if there was a rapture, if I couldn't find my friends, like, you know, <laughs> you know? and so um, there's this movement that happens in the 70s and 80s that I, again, walked into. And... What you find in that movement is you find that the basic conception of God is that God is angry, God is white, God is male, and God is Christian. Not only Christian, but Christian fundamentalist. And so as God being a Christian fundamentalist who is angry, white, and male, what it means for God to win the war, um, you know, I actually think that um, Empire Strikes Back probably could have been conceptualized in their mind to be 
you know, they are the good guys and Darth Vader is the bad guy. He's Satan. And we're going to try to win. And central to that idea of winning is winning Israel because Jesus doesn't come back again until all the Jews convert. So a lot of what, um, what we've already heard is, is, uh, is um, put into put into political practice, um, uh, and and therefore um, uh, influences the political and global engagement of evangelicals and especially fundamentalists from that point forward. And I think it's worth also noting. I said before that these are the same people who were pushing um, the segregationist movement. Well, they're also the same people who tried in the 1970s all the way to 1983 to protect um, white male Christian space, um, the, the, the purity of white male Christian space in America. So what we're seeing with the white Zionism in, uh, in Israel is only reflected, it's a direct reflection of what's happening here in America, but here they're not fighting for Jews, they're fighting for them to actually have um, dominion on American soil. So, I flash forward, um, and in the 2000s, I took, uh, I think it's like 2000 and maybe 18, I took my first trip to Africa, actually, and I ended up going to South Africa. And um, in South Africa, I could see very clearly the, uh, the geographical, economic, um, social impacts of white male angry Christian fundamentalist God, basically. And what that, what that um, understanding of God does is it then creates human hierarchy of belonging and human hierarchy of, um, of leadership. So those who rule, we understand them to be ordained to rule, um, are white men. And you could see that very, very clearly in South Africa. And the land itself tells the story through the segregation of the people that was inspired by the US, by the way, um, and inspired around the same time that Christian Zionists, I learned by reading this book, Holy War, which I highly do recommend. Um, I can't vouch for everything that this person says. I think he might get a, like a few details a little bit off because um, he's studying it from the outside, but he also has a really good, um, a, a, an amazingly clarifying take on the early um, uh, work of fundamentalists to push Zionism into Jerusalem and into um, the Israeli government. It's something that they didn't actually originally conceive of themselves. They were convinced to go towards Zionism by Christian white male fundamentalists. Um, so you see the impact of that uh, white male segregationist movement in America in South Africa. So I took another trip just the next year to Bethlehem and I saw the same thing and I was blown away. I saw the, the partition, I saw the, the economic um, destruction of the Palestinian people. I saw um, the dehumanization. I saw the, the impoverishment and, and the blindness to it that you don't only see in South Africa, you see it in America. And you then also can see it in Israel. And it makes sense because it's at the heart of it. The catalyst for it are all the same people. It's the same movement in America that is the catalyst for it all. So what is, um, what is the remedy? Because the bent toward Christian, white Christian nationalism does not only shape the impact of the religious right in the US, it also impacts our global engagement um, the remedy for evangelicals is twofold. One, to decolonize our faith, our read of the scriptures, um, and our understanding of God, and our understanding of Jesus and every single biblical character, and to build a robust theology of the image of God. I think that those two things, if we were to do those two things as evangelicals, then we would actually see um, the, the possibility of dismantling um, this fundamentalist, dispensationalist, dominionist understanding of Israel. And I'll just go very quickly into what I mean by decolonizing the biblical text. When I was writing the Very Good Gospel, 
um, which is this green book behind me. Um, when I was writing this book, I, um, I, the last chapter that I wrote was chapter one, and it was the vision itself. And as I was studying Genesis one, which has really been my core text forever, um, uh, for like the last 20 years, um, I was struck by the reality that the writers of this text were enslaved and on their way out of enslavement as they were writing this text, if it is, as many scholars believe, um, the, the priests on their way out of Babylon who are, um, who are writing that text, then we know that, um, that they are actually writing commentary on the worldview of their oppressors. And they've been told by their oppressors that they are created to be enslaved to the gods and how much more even than enslaved to them, to the Babylonians, because they are the prizes of war. And so now on the way out, they proclaim this thing called the image of God, um, that all humanity is made in the image of God. And that in that time was a radical concept. Never before in the history of civilization had anybody placed the image of God inside all humanity. It had only been reserved for the kings and the queens. But here in this conception, there is no hierarchy of human belonging because all humanity is made in the image of God. And what that means is that according to the text, all humanity is created to exercise dominion in the world. All humanity is created to exercise stewardship of the world and the land, to, to um, make decisions, exercise agency that impact the world. So if we were to gain um, a robust theology of the image of God, then that comes directly against this idea that well, first of all, only white men are, are created to lead, but also that only fundamentalist Christians or even Christians are created to lead. Actually, all humanity is created in the image of God. And it also struck me that these people, the, the Jewish people throughout history and every writer of the entire biblical text, none of them are based in Europe. None of them have white skin. None of them um, are, are writing this from the social location of empire. Even David and Solomon were kings, but kings of a dinky little kingdom that kept getting sacked. And so there was no way that they wrote Genesis 1 or any word of the entire Bible from the perspective of Constantine or, um, or any one of our presidents or anyone who was seeking um, to subjugate or dominate on earth. Instead, <laughs> the work of the scripture is the work of the oppressed ones calling on God to create equity um, and to create parity between humans so that all of us might stand in a circle and make decisions about how we live together, together. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, you've given us so much to think with here uh, as we continue on in this conversation, but I especially just wanna underscore this theology of dominion that you talked about and the ways in which um, whiteness are central to that, the ways in which uh, gender dynamics play a role there and the way that Israel also plays a central role uh, in that theology. And so I just wanna to underscore that. Uh, thank you for all that you've shared. Um, and I want to turn it now um, to Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis and ask if you can help us think about how evangelical support of Israel contributes to the American political landscape. Uh, does it equate to political power here in the U.S.? And are there ways that other Christian communities in the U.S. can play a role in this um, pretty complicated dynamic? Yeah, thank you so much. I'm uh, really honored to be in this conversation today uh, with Lisa and Bruce and with you, Jennifer. And God, I feel like I have so much to say. I'm gonna try to focus here. Um, I wanna just start with maybe theology because we've heard beautiful theological reflections from both uh, Lisa and Bruce. And I, I, wanna, I wanna pick on a theology of chosenness. I just, I just wanna dive into chosenness as a problem, right? Um, we understand, all of us who do this theological work, that theology is the work of the people trying to understand the events of the world that they think they attribute to God. 
I really appreciate the way Lisa and Bruce both laid out some pieces of that. I can only imagine those those people in the Hebrew uh, texts wrestling with identity and belonging and place and land and violence and destruction and over and over again, oppression and feeling outside, outside of safety and out, right outside of security. And that the theological wrestlings of that, you know, um, I'm a psychologist too, y'all. And so the psychological wrestlings with annihilation and the feeling of um, desperation and trauma creates a theology of meaning making. Like, why is this happening to us? And I'm not trying to talk about biblical literalism now, or I'm not trying to talk about, you know, what I'm just, I can't do it, right? We don't have enough time for that. But I'm just going to kind of go at the meaning, the feeling of the meaning in that can be, our, our God, though, really loves us. And we have a covenant with our God. And even though, right, captivity, and even though brokenness, and even though destroyed temples, right, twice, and even though we're in the wilderness, and we got to make a mishkan, and take God with us on the move, even though all of that, all of that, right, even though God comes down from the mountain to be with us and talk to us, even though we're led by a pillar of cl cloud and a pillar of fire, even though when we're hungry and mad, because we'd rather be enslaved than be hungry, our God makes a menu of quail and bread, even though there's some way in which existentially we've been threatened. We just are not alive. We're not well. And so what does that mean? Well, it means we belong in a special way to God anyway, I think, right? We belong in a special way to God anyway. God picked us. That God picked us. What? What? Why? To show God's glory through us. God picked us picks on us, gets mad at us, you know, has temper tantrums about us. In other words, God's a certain kind of parent or a certain kind of suzerain. And this God of, of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Leah, you know, Miriam, this God who liberates us also somehow allows the, the trauma, allows the danger, allows the violence. Al what, what kind of like cognitive dissonance must that make in theologically wrestling? So this, this feeling of chosenness, this theology of chosenness, we've been chosen to suffer. We are the suffering servant. We've been chosen to suffer on behalf of the world. And in the end, God will redeem us. Now, this is the backstory that is the story inside evangelical Christianity, right? Because Israel is the suffering servant, but then Jesus is the suffering servant. By Jesus' stripes, we're healed. All those things that Bruce and Lisa laid out. We, we are, we Christian evangelicals, especially, kind of inherit this story. It's the Jewish book, but they in, we inherit this story. We make it our own. And when I say our, I really want to say there because I'm not an evangelical Christian. <laughs> I, I'm not. Um, but this, this, this becomes then, to me, the roots of manifest destiny. We've been grafted in to the, right? We've been grafted into the thing, Woof, Paul says. Well, and and you know we can do, um, you know, uh, we've not been substituted in. We've been grafted in. But the good Jews are going to come to Christian. Paul does a whole bunch of stuff of that in Romans chapter seven eight, so we can understand. You know, God didn't change God's mind. <laughs> But the new way to be in the new way to be chosen is to become Christian. And the new way to become chosen is to become Christian against the original chosen people, which is all kinds of talk to have about how crazy that is. Like the, the, the I'm just gonna call that crazy town theology that has got a certain kind of circuitousness to it. That God chose the Jews 
to suffer, by the way, to prove God can save them someday, then the chosenness transfers to the Christians because God changed God's mind about the Jews and decided really the way to be in covenant and to be chosen is to believe in Jesus. But the Jesus, but Jesus is killed by the Jews, but Jesus is a Jew. And all of that is so insane, it's even just hard to track. But in the bottom analysis, God can't change Hebrews. There's no shadow of changing. But 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 we still changed God in our understanding. We changed God a couple different times in our understanding. Our theology of God changed changed a couple different ways that are hugely problematic for this moment. One, as Lisa highlights in her book, the good gospel, we're good. We're good. God loves us. We're good. But a talking snake talks the world into believing that we're not good. So the theology of uh, chosenness grows up on top of a theology of we're worms. Can you feel the other distance I'm trying to put in here? We were good. And then we screwed up because we ate the fruit because the talking snake told us to. My friend John Kenny calls that fallen theology. So the snake causes what is good to not be good. We're not deserving of love. We, we, we suffer because we're the suffering servant too. And then Jesus comes along and stops the suffering, but he has to be killed and die to suffer to make it better. All of that is insane. And what's inside that to me the problem of chosenness is the, the transference of the chosenness from the Jewish people to the white people who empire Christianity on day one. Okay, day 313, Constantine. But as soon as Christian becomes a state religion, and it's not the movement of Palestinian poor people trying to figure it out, Jesus is a Jew, Jesus is a Jew, Jesus is a Jew, a Jew from Nazareth, which was in Palestine, now Palestine, he's not trying to start a new religion. But this, this transference of this love, fierce love, you know, feed the poor, share your goods in common, right? Love the earth, love the people, love the children. That core message of Yeshua ben Yosef turns into how can we codify what is empire? in the name of God. And, and what gets codified around chosen is we get to take over the world. We get to get on boats and go to other places and quote, discover the land, except steal the land. We get to go to shores of Africa and steal the bodies and build the world. That's the problem of chosenness. And now you've got white evangelical chosenness in bed with Israel chosenness that we, and by the way, I met combatants for, for peace on my second visit to Israel. So impressive, so impressive. I just did my fourth trip. So this is the problem. And if we talk about it that way, we're anti-Semitic. If we question, if I question chosenness is in the Christian trope, I'm just a heretic, <laughs> which I am. Happy to be one. But if I question chosenness in the context of Israel, then I'm anti-Semitic. And, and, and of course I'm not anti-Semitic, but the questions of what does it mean for some of us to be chosen and some of us not to be chosen ought to be questions that Christians ask because we, we follow in the way of a, of a rabbi who taught us who God chooses. Let me be particular. The rich young ruler asks our rabbi, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, to love God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. And then the rich young ruler wants to know why, what do you mean? And Jesus tells a story of a Samaritan loving well. Not the, not the priest, not the Levite, but the Samaritan who's a hated other. He's not chosen, right? Lisa Bruce, the Samaritan is not chosen. So, so, so Jesus chooses the outsider to break out the categories of what who's inside outside all the time the gospel is about inversion what i'm trying to say is absolutely ironic and insane for there to be a, a kind of sense that that 
God, the God of Jesus wants to continue to perpetuate outsiderness for anybody. So Palestinians are outside in Israel. And we can't talk about it. This is the way it affects our American political landscape. Whiteness, which is my code for white Christian nationalism, whiteness needs outsiderness to survive. Whiteness needs an enemy. White supremacist Christianity needs others. They can be Muslim, they can be black, they can be queer, they can be trans, they can be poor, they can be immigrants. It needs white, it needs outsiderness. The core message is I am the way, the truth and the life and no one gets to the father by me. That's 144,000 of us only and that's it and that's all. And it's a small club and you're not in it, <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't even try. <laughs> Lisa, walk down the aisle. Yeah, but you're not really in it. Not really, right? You're not white enough. You're not male enough to be in it. The powerful way that that keeps getting re-articulated over and over and over again. Like, don't say America is not like that. It is like this. It's been like this. It gets articulated over and over again. The white empire Christian, the white supremacist Christian-ish mentality articulated over and over again, articulated in uh, the slave trade, articulated in the um, uh, uh, annihilation of, of Native Americans, articulated in the Holocaust articulated in South Africa. And now in an unholy alliance, white Christian nationalists masquerading, masquerading as lovers of God have hijacked our politic here to keep making chosenness for just a few of us. You gotta be, look a certain way. You gotta breathe a certain way. You gotta go to the certain college. You gotta believe a certain kind of way. You gotta believe a certain kind of Christianity in which the Jews, y'all forgive me, are a pawn. Because we still anti-Semitic as hell, those folks. But, but as Bruce so aptly pointed out, right? In some kind of transactional way, in some kind of guilt way, in some kind of substitutionary way, and worse, in some kind of like, you know, uh, end of time apocalyptic way. Once those Jews that we don't really like become Christian, we're all gonna fly up out of here in a spaceship to heaven. That's so crazy. <laughs> so the, the, the power is the whiteness. And in the narrative of white evangelical, white supremacist, call it all the things you want, we're all pawns. And maybe to just quickly go to what can we do about it? How can we, what can other Christian communities do? Just get smart about the exegesis of this stuff. There's so many good resources out there to, to undo our chosenness theology. And to one, two, build coalitions across faith to sort of dilute that crazy Christianity. And three, I think there's some hope to find in the way young evangelicals Young evangelicals, even young Jewish people are getting clear about the occupation. Like the, my friends say the word occupation. They say it out loud, they <laughs> write it down, and <laughs> right? So that we can be honest about it. And I think the younger people, younger Jews, yet certainly younger Democrats, and certainly younger evangelicals have been awakened in a way. And I don't mean they're woke, they're not. They're awakened in a way about social justice about Black Lives Matter, they're making the connection to Palestine, they're making the connection about immigration, they're making connections about outsiderness versus chosenness. And that gives me hope and we wanna amplify that work. Thank you, thank you so much, Jackie. Um, I really appreciate you kind of uh, distinguishing for us um, this paradigm of chosenness and otherness from Paul to the present. Uh, that was, it was pretty That's a good. I should write that book. Take us all that way. Let anybody write that. That's good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you. So yeah. what we're going to do now is, um, I think what I'd like to do is 
kind of combine our Q&A time with the response within the panelists. So we've got a lot of questions that have come through, a lot of really great ones. Uh, I'd like to read off a few of them and offer them up. Uh, and then maybe we can kind of just take turns, panelists, if you want to respond to any or multiple of those questions and or one another and any of the things that, that you all have contributed today, I think that would be great. Um, if it's all right with the three of you, we may um, go five to 10 minutes over so that we can have a little bit more time for Q&A. Um, if that's not all right with anyone, uh, please say so, or you can send me a, a private message. Um, and then I, I do just wanna make a note and say that we're gonna be sharing a list of resources in the YouTube notes on the recording of this webinar. And so I know folks were asking the author of the book you were holding up, Lisa. So if you wanna put that in the chat as well, feel free, but we'll be sharing a more robust list of resources uh, with the recording of this talk as well. So I'm gonna offer up a couple of questions that we got through the chat um, and then turn it over to you all. So we have a question here about uh, why it is that there's also a growth in uh, Hispanic engagement in Christian Zionism. Um, this question asker said, I understand the relationship of, of white males to this narrative of, of Christian Zionism, but what's, what's the link here and what's the draw into that perspective? Is there a link there with the prosperity gospel? Another question is um, a question about the book of revelations. Uh, what about, um, according to this question asker, what about the very specific set of requirements for the return of Jesus in the book of revelations? How do we address that when it comes to, um, when it comes to the narratives uh, of apocalypticism that are embedded in Christian Zionism? So if anyone wants to speak to that question, that's a good one. Uh, another question, how do Palestinian Christians fit within the evangelical concept that Bruce described? Uh, and, and a question that kind of links with that, what is the role of anti-Arabism in this, in this kind of uh, racist theological structure that's been, been outlined here, uh, in addition to, of course, anti-Semitism, which all of you have, have spoken to. And then uh, lastly here, who are the, the we that are chosen? I, I think that that uh, was articulated pretty well by you, Jackie, in the last bit that you shared. Um, but if anyone else wants to share a bit more on that, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there for the questions. And whoever would like to start first, feel free. Can I jump in really quickly? Because I'm going to really quickly, really quickly, Lisa. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to just point out and this that I'm going to go first so people can just get mad at me. <laughs> mad at me. If we're going to read our Bible like that, if we're going to read the Bible like these are the conditions under which Jesus is going to come again. And my mommy died five, five years ago. And she'd be right now asking me, Lisa, she'd be like, is this the apocalypse right now, Jackie? <laughs> Are these the end times? Is that what's happening? Because it looks like it to me, right? Mm -hmm. but, there, but, but this, this again, um, you know, chosen, like chosen to go into Canaan and kill the people and take the land. I'm just going to say it so people can get mad at me. Do, we do I serve a God who picked some people to go into a land and kill the people so they can have the land? If that's the God I serve, then Hitler gets to kill the Jews to have white supremacy, and the white people get to kill the Indians to take America. That's just not right. So there's something we need to think about and examine in that. And also then, if we're gonna have that hermeneutic of suspicion, which I do, then we can also have a suspicion about revelation as a text. That's why I wanted to jump in that, that question. Do we really, do I, do I really think that the world has to end and the Jews have to be converted and the things have to burn and combust for Jesus to come again? Or is Jesus here? I, I'm just saying. So I want us to just think about biblical interpretation as our friend or our not. That, that's, that's what I'm saying in terms of liberation. And I'm done, Lisa, go. <laughs> so Bruce, is it okay for me to jump in? Cause I have a, First. I actually think I'm gonna have to go pretty soon. So it'd be helpful for me to just get it all out here. Um, the first thing I actually, I wanna respond to um, is, is the concept of what is God's goal anyway? The goal of God. 
Because if the goal of God is empire, then especially as we understand empire, then to dominate others um, is understandable. And so the crusades are understandable. And um, and yeah, Hitler is understandable and all the rest is all right. understandable. And, and also, um, and then, you know, flip it on its head. And um, you might actually say that, um, that the domination of Palestinians by the, by the state of Israel right now might be understandable. If the goal of God is, is empire, is domination, right. then that's understandable. Um, I, I will say also, I say this, I mean, just, well, I'll just say this with a caveat that I, I very much understand and respect the deep existential fear that people who are Jewish feel in this world, especially right now. Yep. That the reality of our, of Jewish history is that they have been targeted, that they, that Jewish people and communities, nation, um, communities within, within different nations have been targeted. Um, I had on, on my podcast, um, Freedom Road, I had the amazing um, privilege of speaking with um, uh, Rabbi Sharon Browse and also um, Rabbi Jill and you, um, what is Rabbi Jill's last name? Forgive me. Jill Jack Jacobs? Yeah. Jill yes, Jacobs? Jill Jacobs, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Um, Trua. Um, and they really, really schooled me. And they, they, sh they, they shared that they all have passports at the ready wherever they go because they just don't know when the pogrom's gonna come, but it's gonna come. The understanding within the Jewish community is it's gonna end. And people are on heightened awareness right now because anti-Semitic talk and all of it is all right there. So I say all of this with that understanding, but I'm just saying, what is God's goal? What I've come to understand is God's goal, or at least what I see as God's goal in the scripture, which is counter to what I learned in my evangelical spaces. I was taught that God's goal was perfection, that God's goal was perfection, and that God chose the weakest of the people, the Hebrews, the, as they were called um, within my evangelical world, because um, they were small, and, um, and so they were not an empire to, to then um, show up everybody else, right? And, and actually, that the intent there was not as it was taken. The intent was to demonstrate God's power um, through the weakest one. Now we actually see that we see that mo that motif throughout Scripture. So that's not I wouldn't I wouldn't counter that. But what I would say is that um, if God's goal is purity and perfection, then when we see sin, when we think of sin, sin is then about becoming pure, becoming right, becoming perfect. And so then we look at Genesis one and we ask the question, were we perfect or were we not? But I contend that through my script, my study of that scripture, that is not at all on the mind of the writers of Genesis one. Genesis one has nothing to do with whether or not we are perfect or even good. Genesis one, and, and according to my read is about whether or not the relationships the relatedness between created beings is overwhelmingly good or not. And so what it looks like to have the relatedness that God created us for is to have all humanity operating um, in a way where all humanity understands that the other possesses the image of God and therefore is called to exercise dominion as in stewardship of the world. And also to understand that in the very beginning, when that text was written, the people would have um, people would have read that image of God and understood that the image of the king is not only a marker of where the king rules, but the image of the king is a marker of the health of the kingdom. So if the king um, has a bunch of busted up um, statues and melted down coins of, of oneself in, in that kingdom, you know there's war against the kingdom happening. So the implication then in today's politics, not only in America, not only in South Africa, but also in Israel, but within the state of Israel is where you see busted up, toppled over, melted down, um, covered up, erased images of God within Palestine, you also see war against God. 
you see war against the image of God on earth. So there are political implications to our read of the scripture. Um, and that will take me to Latino Zionism. Latino Zionism is rising out of Latino Pentecostalism, which is really one of the fastest growing um, edges of the church right now. It's, it's the Pentecostal church and it's in particular the Latino Pentecostal church. And that has um, repercussions in their, on their politics because many of those denominations are Latino denominations that come out of white denominations. So they get a view of the world or they were, they were missionized by, by white folks and, um, and that white supremacist, white patriarchal worldview was actually then um, uh, laid on top of them and, and eaten whole cloth. Um, Revelation, if you understand the book of Revelation, you understand that it's directly connected. It's not dispensational. It actually relates right back to Genesis. In fact, the last chapter of, of Revelation is actually a um, like a Hail Mary pass, uh, you know, helping us to go right back to Genesis 1, where the, the tree or Genesis 2, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is not any longer in Revelation. Now it is only the tree of, of um, a tree of life. And that tree of life, the leaves are for the healing of the nations. So I once had a theology professor, um, Shalom professor, say to me, you know, the white church plays at revelations. The white church dabbles in revelations. And because they don't understand suffering, they do something to it that was not intended to be. But the people who wrote revelations, the one who wrote was from a brown colonized people that was serially enslaved. And unless you are reading it from that perspective, there is no way you're going to understand it. And the last piece is what is the role of anti-Arabism? I'll, um, I'll hail to one of, the, one of the people who is, I believe, on the board of Christians um, for Middle East Peace, um, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Andrea um, Smith. She actually breaks up this, she has this amazing concept of the logics of white supremacy. And I just want to point you to that because what she says of the logic of white supremacy as it is applied to people of Middle Eastern and Asian descent is that they are the perpetual enemy because they are conceived by whiteness as being almost human and so therefore a threat, but not quite human. So they need to be dominated. So you can see that logic applied to people of Arab descent or Middle Eastern descent. And then who are the we that are chosen? Um, I think we've answered that. Yeah, thanks so much, Lisa. And, and Bruce, as, as you um, uh, share as well, we've gotten a couple of requests that, that you might um, finish what you were going to say um, before and just a little bit more into the particulars of, uh, you know, maybe some of the, the policies and physical ways uh, that evangelicals are complicit, uh, both through U.S. policy and on the ground. Thank you. Uh, it's, I like that the conversation took a, a bit of a biblical turn uh, at a certain point there, and, and we're all struggling with what to do with this uh, dangerous book, right? This The Bible that describes uh, the, the conquest of Canaan and, and has this very militant uh, ending. But um, if we have time, we can come back to that. I, I, that's one of the things I love to do is think about how to read the Bible. My list of four things that I was going to present earlier um, Bruce, I'm uh, sorry. Ways I'm, that, that... I'm going to interrupt you just for a moment, just to thank yeah. Jackie for being with us. And perhaps Lisa, we might have to lose both of them here. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to both uh, for being with us and for your beautiful uh, and important contributions. And Bruce, I'm going to be in touch with you because I want to hear everything you're about to say. <laughs> Thanks, All everyone. Right. Okay. Ditto. Okay. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you. So um, the first of my my four on my list is, is, is obvious, right? Fundraising and, and lobbying. Uh, so there's there are groups I'd encourage you to go on, on the websites of organizations like Christians United for Israel or the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem, uh, uh, Christian Broadcasting Network. They all have uh, pretty sophisticated websites that detail programming and agenda, mission, a vision. Uh, it's all, um, you know, it's all Zionist. Um, they're fine with Israel as a Jewish state. 
they're supply, fine with uh, settlement growth. In fact, they raise money to help people move to settlements. Uh, they bring so so funding and lobbying. It's a di it's difficult to know how much influence Christian Zionists have when it comes to lobbying because they're competing with other lobby groups, right? They're alongside APAC. They're alongside the billionaire club like uh, Sheldon Adelson and others. Um, they they're competing with the military industrial complex. They're competing with the oil lobby. So how how much does the Christian Zionist community genuinely change US foreign policy on the ground? I'm not smart enough to answer that question, um, but it certainly seems to be a factor. And it was certainly highlighted for us uh, during the Trump administration. Um, a second uh, way Christian Zionists get involved is through what I call solidarity tourism. So you come with these groups to the Holy Land, you're going to visit Visit Bible sites, um, but you're also going to visit Israeli uh, figures, Israeli officials, battlefields, military positions. Uh, you're going to go with Israeli guides, stay in those Israeli hotels. You'll just blow in and out of Bethlehem. You won't talk to the people. You'll pretty much ignore the, the Palestinian reality. Um, so there's there's lots of organizations that do that kind of sort of sanitized, blinded uh, tourism. And, and volunteering. A third one I alluded to is, is promoting Aliyah. There are organizations, Christian Zionist organizations, that raise money to fly Jews from Israel, sorry, from Russia, Eastern Europe to Israel. They, they, um, they often will then insert or settle these folk, these new immigrants in the West Bank. So they're actually contributing to the, uh, the uh, fragmentation of West Bank territory and undermining a possible future um, uh, state of Palestine. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, um, I call it storytelling. Uh, this is the, the narrative that you hear, uh, certainly at major events, Kufi has its Night to Honor Israel, the ICEJ has its Feast of Tabernacles. So there's these major uh, platforms. There's also pulpits around the country, there are books, social media, uh, Christian news, and all of this uh, is involved in telling a story. And this is a story that then evangelicals kind of grow up with. It's kind of in the air and in in the water. When I taught at Westmont College in California, the kids that came to me had just kind of breathed some of this in. They weren't hardcore, thoughtful, reflective Christian Zionists, but they had imbibed a, a narrative. And the narrative is, of course, that Israel's uh, origins and victories are miraculous, that it seeks peace with its Arab neighbors, and the Arabs only want war, that Israel is perpetually vulnerable, it's a victim, although it's invincible. Um, it tends to confuse and conflate the modern nation state of Israel with biblical Israel. It focuses on pa Israeli security and not Palestinian. I've got a long list of things that is part of this narrative that gets repeated as though true, and it's an uncritical embrace. Oftentimes, it's just kind of national mythology, and it doesn't get tested. It doesn't get um, put up against some uh, current research that's gone on or some history, some 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 modern uh, work that's kind of deconstructed that, uh, that narrative. They'll say in this narrative, Israel isn't perfect, but um, they'll never take seriously any kind of formal criticism. So those are some of the ways uh, very quickly that, that um, um, Christian Zionists are um, engaged and active. I don't think uh, do I have a couple more minutes just to address a few of the questions or are we running out of time here? Um, unfortunately, we have to wrap it up and okay. I, it pains me to say that um, because this is uh, so important and I want to continue hearing from you. Um, yeah. Do you want to say maybe 30 seconds in closing and then I can pass it off to Beth to close us out? Sure, 30 seconds. Um, are Christian Zionists anti-Semitic? I think I think in some traditions they objectify the Jews. The Jews are sort of a a player on their uh, apocalyptic uh, stage, and in that sense they're just using them in their in their narrative. But I don't think that's true of all. I, I mean, Christianity has always been conversionist, and has tried to uh, draw converts from wherever. Um, so Christian Zionism, I think. Can, can or cannot be, depending on its version. It, sometimes it's very philo-Semitic and, and not anti-Semitic. So I, that's one, one thought. The other last thought I'll just say is that um, it's fascinating to me how the American national myth that today we 
you know, kind of talk about when we're talking about Christian nationalism and the Jewish national myth have mutually informed each other. So the, the Americans could look back on Israel and say, we are the chosen people now. Some Americans would say, the Jews aren't chosen, just us. Other Americans would say, the Jews are still chosen, but so are we. We're the sort of Gentile uh, nation raised up by God to be exceptional and to do God's work uh, on behalf of God and Israel. Um, so these two stories of exceptionalism have reinforced each other. And when Israel, uh, the, the modern Zionist project emerges, it can look back to the American experiment. And it can say, look, the Americans colonized uh, it's empty land. That's what we're doing when we colonize Palestine. So these two stories of exceptionalism haven't canceled each other out, but they've actually been mutually uh, reinforcing and creating, I think, a, a real perfect storm that now in the U.S. Uh, we've got to deal with. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Bruce. Uh, there's so much that you shared um, that's really helpful and, and valuable for this conversation, and many have reflected that in their comments in the chat, so I just wanted to name that out loud. Um, if you would like to connect further with Bruce, you can find him at the Network of Evangelicals for the Middle East, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Beth now to, to close us out. Well, first of all, thank you to everybody um, for sticking with us and for this talk. Um, oops, we just lost the spotlight. There we go. Um, so thank you all so, so much. We really appreciate you joining us. And a big thank you to Churches for Middle East Peace for partnering with us. Um, and of course, to Combatants for Peace and all the activists on the ground doing the work. Um, we're so grateful to everybody, like across the field, frankly, who are making a difference. Um, and just so everybody knows, I know this is something that I talked about at some of the other sessions and not necessarily this one, but every American citizen, um, your funding, your, your money, your taxes go directly to support the occupation, to support the military. And every American taxpayer pays about $25 and 25 cents each year. So if you would like to offset your taxes, make a big difference in turning that around. Um, both Combatants for Peace and Churches for Middle East Peace uh, could really appreciate your support. Um, so those donation links are in the chat box and I can't tell you how much it really means to us, especially this year, um, a year when there's so much else going on and attention is focused in so many places. Um, it is the work um, really of these organizations fighting for human rights uh, in Palestine and Israel um, that is making a difference. So please, please consider supporting that work. Um, and thank you again to our incredible esteemed speakers, to our partners, and to all of you for joining us. Thank you. All right. Be well. <laughs>